Live from the JSA Podcast Studio, presenting Data Movers, showcasing the leaders behind the headlines in the telecom and data center infrastructure industry. Welcome, everyone, to our new podcast series, Data Movers. I'm your host, Jamie Scott Okataya, founder and CEO of JSA, along with my fabulous co host, top B2B social influencer, Mr. Evan Christel. Hey, Evan. Hey, everyone. Good to see you, Jamie, and everyone else. Uh, another great episode where we sit down with the most influential folks in the data and telecom space, uh, which support the new requirements of this uh, brave new world we're in. So, Jamie, uh, Bitcoin is all in the news. Are you a cryptocurrency enthusiast? You know, I follow a few companies, but uh, I'm, I've been watching your tweets is really where I've been getting my my latest knowledge of, of the Bitcoin like rave uh, <laughs> craziness. What's going on? Well, don't rely on me for financial advice. That's my first uh, suggestion. <laughs> um, but do you have a, a wallet? Do you have a crypto wallet where you buy bit, uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies? Or is that not yet on your... Not list. me personally, but but certainly some of my friends, yes. Yeah, so we've seen Bitcoin go past the uh, epic $50,000 mark, which, um, you know, given that it was, you know, not too long ago, a few dollars, it's kind of an, an, an incredible Spring. milestone. And the whole crypto space is on fire. And I think you asked me before the show, like, what's behind this? And I wish I knew. What, what do you think? Uh, you know, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna say what you said to me. You know, we're all talking about it, so it's driving it's driving the numbers. I mean, it's it's all perception, right? So, you know, perception is reality, and the perception right? is that uh, you know the dollar's going to collapse, or it's a hedge against uh, economic turmoil, or that it's some um, has some magical fairy dust that's been sprinkled on it. You know, it kind of reminds me of the tulip craze in the 17th century. Netherlands, where, you know, people would bid up tulips to, you know, thousands of dollars per bulb. You know, there's no inherent value, but some pretty big names like Elon Musk and some banks and others are all in. So um, what do you think? Buy, sell, or hold Bitcoin? What's what's your personal uh, well, the uh, guess at this point? Uh, yeah, I mean, buy, buy and... and uh... Uh, ride and then sell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Jim Cramer on the line here. I actually decided I had some Bitcoin I, I've been putting in. I, I sold it all at 50000 I thought, you know, just take my money and run. I had a good ride for a little bit. And that wasn't one of the early buyers. But, um, you know, I, I'd hate to see that, that gain that I had uh, disappear, which these things can do. But, but on to our next topic, speaking of tech trends and hot technology, who do we have uh, with us today? Yeah, yeah. Actually, I, I think there's a, a beautiful transition here because, uh, you know, I, I think Bitcoin wouldn't be where it's at if there wasn't um, uh, uh, a look into secure methods of transport. And, um, and as we, this leads us into our introduction to um, BDX and the CEO and his unique perspectives of the future of our industry. So today, please welcome Bram Singh. Welcome, Bram. Hi there, Jamie. Hi, hi, Evan. Uh, nice to good to good to see you and hear you, Bram. You're you're in Hong Kong at the moment. Pretty exciting place. Any any insights into how's uh, Hong Kong treating you at the moment? Hong Kong's lovely. Hong Kong has always been good to me. Whenever I have faltered in my life or career, Hong Kong has picked me up. So for me, Hong Kong, you know, I live in Virginia, uh, Oakton, Virginia, that's home. But Hong Kong has always been a second home to me. I love this place. It's fabulous. Well, it's, it's, it's a dynamo uh, of a sort of super city. So tell me a little bit more about Hong Kong in the context of your vision and mission at BDX. You, you know, how did you come to be in Hong Kong and in greater China as well? And how has that mission or vision evolved? Sure, I'm sure. Well, Hong Kong is um, is is important to BDX, but it's not central to BDX. BDX is uh, more of a pan Asian um, uh, play, 
uh, pan asia pac play including china of course uh, vision wise vision wise you know we we barely a year old and we are already profitable and uh, you can attribute that to how we decided to kick off uh, and that was to not get distracted by you know shiny objects and just to focus on one thing and to be great at just one thing rather than being good at many so we have just tried to be the best uh, we are not yet the best be the best at building uh, or housing uh, our customers it infrastructure that's it. that's it that's it just we want to be the best around to uh, to house the infrastructure that that the customer puts in our care that's it so that vision has kept us you know going um, it's behind how we acquire other data centers or build data centers and the vision vision has not changed it's not changed uh, even though our customer profile has changed so when we started off our customers were largely um, enterprises large enterprises medium enterprises and they of course continue to be the mainstay of uh, bdx however however surprisingly for a company this young we have started to attract the large hyperscalers and so now hyperscalers uh, uh, the uh, you know the or you may call them the the the, the large tech companies are now um, part of our customer mix um, it scared me in the beginning i'll tell you i'll be frank because i thought there we go we're going to now go after this uh, large sector and that distracts us from our focus but it did not all it did and i'm so relieved all it did was um, help us focus more on being good at housing uh, uh, our customers it infrastructure so to that extent this change in customer mix which uh, had me concerned in the beginning uh, has not messed with our vision so that's our vision it's you know it's got nothing to do with hong kong per se though hong kong is uh, is important uh, we are more of a pan asian pan asia pac company and i love your laser focus vision on on the mission it's absolutely critical for um, for success um, and and to launch last year of all years, um, what a what a tough one for many companies. Yet, not just BDX, but even the data center business as a whole has been really thriving, growing, expanding. What do you see as the the main drivers there? So, it's you guys. It's 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 you know the the. The, the credit for any growth in the COVID era goes to goes to the people like you know you and me and Evan and the rest of us scurrying around the internet uh, to eat, work, play, uh, going to the public clouds a lot more than we would normally have, and um, all of that translates into more data centers. Those clouds, by the way, are not in the sky; they are in rows upon rows upon endless rows in data centers like ours or my competitors so to that extent the more the hustle bustle on the internet the more data centers you need and uh, that has been the reason really more than i mean i would like to claim that we did a great job which i'm sure we did but we uh, the credit goes to uh, uh, the huge move online which by the way by the way was already taking place prior to the pandemic right so it's not as if the pandemic came and suddenly everyone moved uh, on online that's not the case online activity has been building up and building up and building up the pandemic comes and simply accelerates it and um, uh, gives it an impetus that wasn't there before now there are some irreversible changes that are going to take place as a result of the pandemic right there's no denying that and that's take two of them uh, our, our eating habits and our travel, right? Uh, your eating, your restaurants are gonna come back, you know, to some extent, but a large percentage of their revenue is gonna come from takeout, home delivery. Home delivery is the thing now, right? So that's not gonna change. That's gonna only get bigger. So the pie, if, if a restaurant looks at its, its revenue source, it's gonna be takeaway 
more than in in-house dining, I suspect. But a bigger hit is going to be, or a bigger change, I shouldn't say hit, is going to be uh, to the travel industry. So personal travel is going to come back, of course. Like I'm now, uh, you know, end of this month, I plan to fly to, to, to San Francisco to see my daughter um, and family. Um, so personal travel is going to happen, right? But, um, but business travel is going to be limited, reduced. Um, you're not going to have people like me or my colleagues traveling uh, to, uh, on business as much as uh, they were in the past. I would, I would travel for, to construction sites, but to meet a customer or uh, my first uh, recourse would be all this fabulous uh, video conferencing abilities that have been granted to us over the internet uh, ever since the internet became a video playground. Um, that's another story. Um, so, um, you know, uh, our video conferencing, uh, home delivery, working from home, all of this means um, more data centers. Uh, so really, the, uh, that's why you are seeing the data centers, you know, uh, doing a double digit growth these days, not just us, but our competitors too. And, and that is, and that's where the, the, the change, the permanent change happened, I think. Great, great insight. So let, let's get into some details. So you're growing at BDX, you're entering new markets, acquiring new facilities across Asia. Um, I, I see you've built a state-of-the-art new data center in Nanjing in China. Tell us about what's unique about this facility, how it's better or different than anything you've done before. So, um, the, the, the Nanjing facility uh, came up just when we had uh, decided on how we're going to structure BDX. The one way BDX is different from a lot of my uh, uh, friends in the competition is that we have um, our data centers are highly automated, minimally, minimally manned, sorry, minimally manned, highly automated and connecting back to a central, what we call C cubed, that is centralized customer command and control. So our central platform now is patched into every data center in the BDX cluster. So a lot of stuff that would remain in data center, a lot of activities, a lot of um, um, manpower that would be in each data center has now been centralized. So of course you can't centralize electrical and plumbing and, and mechanical uh, 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 activities, they, they remain in data centers, but the rest of it is all centralized. So now, uh, and this is the only way, this is the only way we could have managed to do all these acquisitions uh, uh, effectively and, uh, and economically, because you can't just get acquire a data center and then you know get all, so each data center comes with its own complete, you know, business infrastructure and all of that uh, duplication makes it very expensive. So rather we'll centralize that. And to that extent, uh, uh, Nanjing is unique because now it is minimally manned, highly automated, connected back to central command and functioning as, well, I won't say lights out as yet, but as it expands, uh, it'll become an almost lights out data center, which is highly automated. And that's, I think, the future of this industry. The other interesting anecdote pertaining to Nanjing that I would love to share is how it was built in the middle of COVID, um, you know, almost by remote control. I used to visit Nanjing once a month in 2019, and that completely ceased in 2020, when after January, I couldn't go there because there's a lockdown. Okay. And yet in November, when finally I managed to go there and get out of quarantine and go to my data center, I had, we had rather, uh, the data centers staring back at me, completely built, fully functional, without the presence of any senior BDX staff. How did this happen, you ask? It, it is, the, 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 we, had a, we have a young team, we call them under 35s in, in Nanjing. They just said, you know, heck with it, 
they took charge and they supervised and got that building done. So that is the, as far as I'm concerned, you know, it's minimally manned, highly automated. But for me, at a very personal level, uh, the uniqueness of Nanjing is the fact that it was built without us interfering and the team on the ground took matters in their own hands and built a brilliant data center there. So that for me is the uniqueness of Nanjing. That's amazing, that's amazing. And, uh, and I feel like it's a, it's a great transition to this, this next question I have for you, as well as you know, your, your um, high, high focus on, on your mission and, and we have been talking Bitcoin, but um, as the need for more data co-location capacity continues to grow, so of course is the need to safeguard this data. And at BDX, you guys have really developed some tools to, to go over and beyond here, such as your BDX 360 and BDX Smart Hand. So can you tell us more about these solutions and, and the safeguarding that you put in place? Sure, I, I'm, I'm actually very excited about BDX 360 because um, of how, why it happened and, and the, how effective it is. Why it happened, again, I hark back to our focus. You know, we were focused on, we are focused on just delivering housing for IT infrastructure for our customers. So then we built a lot of tools around that housing. And one of the best little things we did was BDX 360. BDX 360, so I spoke about the central command we have. So the guys in central command can go on their PC, laptop, uh, smartphone, wherever, and have a complete insight into the vital signs from every data center in the BDX cluster. So the guys in central command can see the vital signs in Nanjing, Hong Kong, uh, uh, Singapore, uh, and you know manage situations. The same tool, the same 360 BDX 360 tool can be used in each data center by the facilities folks there to manage their data centers. And here's the best part. The same tool can be used by my customers to manage and over and, and, and you know look at, monitor the vital signs in their ecosystem. So whether they have a rack or a cage or a, you know hybrid ecosystem connected public clouds, they can use the 360 to look at all that and manage it. So that's the beauty of this, uh, this, this little piece of IT work we did. It's pretty genius. You know, I, 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 I could do it and deploy it very economically because the same tool we use for central command, each data center and customers. And this is something uh, the competition has been working very hard to do. Some have got there, some haven't, but they've all got there very expense, in a very expensive way we got it done by using the same tool in all these locations. So that's why I find this exciting. And this tool is what gives the customer the security because he, now he can, he can, uh, he, he can access it, uh, you know, using QR codes that only he, that's only generated for him. He can look at what's happening to his racks or his cage and, um, and, and manages, manages uh, ecosystem. Yeah, that, that's super impressive. I, I think there's a view that the data center world is somewhat being commoditized, but it's, it's great to see you innovating there uh, in a major way. So looking at your career, you, you've been in this industry a long time. I, I won't ask how many decades uh, that has oh, been. Oh, it, it uh, shows. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, what, to, but, many, but tell many. me, what are some of, many decades, yes, I'm on my third decade here personally in this industry, but what are some of the biggest changes that you've seen personally over the course of, you know, that career so if, if this is your third decade you you remember this change i'm going to talk about the the the, the first biggest change that i experienced uh, as as a young guy in, in 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 this industry was the demise of the accounting rate um so you know while the accounting rate was in place and just for the for the younger folk on this uh, on this uh, um chat we are having, the counting rate was this completely artificial rate put into place between the two tele telecos, right? They were the masters of their domain. AT&T was master of the US. Hong Kong Telecom was master of 
of Hong Kong. And they decided what's that rate at which they would pay each other for calls they terminate. Uh, completely nothing to do with reality, just a number they would pick so that they could overcharge their customers. So that was the accounting rate. And because of that, you know, when I first joined this industry, we would only fly first class. And then there would be a car pulling up to the tarmac to pick us up. It was like a diplomatic mission. And um, yeah, yeah. So that, that, that ended. When that ended, that was the first big change we, uh, you know, old school guys had to, had to deal with. Um, the second big change, I guess, was the advent of the internet, but not so much the advent of the internet as the internet becoming a video playground. That was the big change when everything and anything could be done on the internet. And that had a great, very interesting, I wouldn't say great because it impacted all of us. It had an interesting twist to the tale. And that is with the advent of the internet becoming a video playground, the mantle of masters of the universe moved from the telcos to the big tech companies. It moved from the telcos to the OTTs or the hyperscalers, the big tech companies, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Microsofts, the uh, Apples, they now called the shots in this business simply because of how the internet uh, transformed itself. So that was the second biggest change in my career. The third one was, an, was a collateral of that and that was the demise of the carrier hotels. You know, earlier you used to have a carrier hotel, you want to connect to, uh, into the uh, internet or connect, you had to go to the carrier hotel and, and interconnect there. Well, soon the independent data center operators like Equinix and others, CoreSight and others came, became more powerful and CoreSight itself, for example, in, in, in Los Angeles, I remember, their carrier hotel was one Wilshire. One Wilshire was, was the queen of the, of, the, of the West Coast and the carrier hotel in 60 Hudson was the queen of the East Coast. And somewhere in the early uh, 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 2000s, uh, core site started building, I think it's 900 Alameda, which became their center of the universe slowly because that's where they, they would house Google. They, that's where they would house content. So co content players and eyeballs then became the, the mainstay uh, and not carrier hotel. So that was, I guess, the third one. The fourth one, I won't go into too much because it, it's not very interesting, but very germane to ch uh, changes. And that is that the subsea cables then became, uh, again, the, uh, uh, the, uh, they were sequestered literally by the, the high-tech companies. So now Google, Facebook build better uh, cables than the telcos. Think about it. The whole subsea universe, which is the artery of the internet, the arteries of the internet are gone from the telcos. Well, they still are there, but the big players are the, yeah. are the high big tech companies. The last change, guys, is something that's going to be happening even as we speak, and that is renewables taking over from fossil fuels. You know, people say, when was that tipping point? Uh, it could have been the advent of the Tesla, it could be a variety of things. I do believe, it could be the Paris Accord, I do believe it was during the presidential debate when Biden, the then candidate Biden, uh, dissed fossil fuels uh, in, the, in, the, in the debate with Trump. And I thought, oh my God, there he's lost the presidency. He's not going to win. He's not going to win. You can't diss fossil fuels in America. He did it. And guess what? Nothing happened. He became the president. And that's because the American public has already reconciled itself to renewables. And mm -hmm. that's the big, big, big change for us in the data center world, because we are not exactly, you know, the, the various municipalities are uh, where we go and, and, and locate ourselves are not exactly enamored by the amount of power we pull and by our carbon footprints. And so renewables are gonna be key to us in the future. This is gonna be the big change. So these are the what, this, four or five changes that I've seen happen in my lifetime. And I'm so glad I, I managed to survive all of these. I hope I survived the renewables one, but yeah. Well, we need to post those five points into an article in the Wall Street Journal tomorrow. That was a great, <laughs> epic answer to uh, 
to a pretty simple question. Thanks, Jamie. Yeah, no, it was a phenomenal, phenomenal answer. And, uh, you know, kind of leads me to my next question, which is a little bird did tell me that uh, when you're not uber busy being CEO of BDX, you also maybe try your hand at writing a few novels. So tell us, and clearly you're a storyteller uh, from, from your last answer. Tell us what have you written and what are you still working on? So I, yeah, uh, well, okay. So I, I write, I, I, I write two hours every day, either five to seven or six to eight in the morning before I do my day job. So this is a habit I uh, cultivated while writing the first novel I wrote. Um, and by the way, I just either I write and I write novels or I'll write tech stuff, nothing in between. So the first novel I wrote, uh, I've written is, is Bombay Swastika. And it's about this um, uh, Jewish refugee from Nazi Germany who ended up in, you know, what was then Bombay, now Mumbai. And um, yeah, so that story uh, took off for three months. I think it was on, on the Amazon best read. And uh, by the way, no, no self-publishing, proper publisher, you know, acquired the rights. And That's great. Do you have a movie deal? Is, can, when can we see the movie? They, they, they are, you know, funny you ask, they are actually, someone's doing what they call a network, so no, a, a Netflix Bible. I don't know what that is. Someone's doing a Netflix Bible on that and they come, keep calling me up. The publisher does to ask for, you know, comments. I do that, but yeah, so who knows? Yeah, we'll find out. I mean, oh, yeah, wonderful. BDX doesn't give me any, any, any time to, 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 <laughs> fant to have those fantasies. So let's see. <laughs> Well, that's, that's, that's fabulous. I, I'd love to read the book. It's a, quite a, a, a fascinating uh, premise, actually. I'm interested in history. Bombay Swastika. Bombay, Bombay Swastika. Pick, take it out. Yeah, get it on. If you get a hard copy, no, I'll, 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 I'll take a look. And you're working on uh, something thanks. now, too? Yeah. I, I, actually, yes, Jimmy. I'm, uh, the, my next book, which I'm work, working on, is called Her Browser History. And it's about, uh, it's about Washington, D.C. politics. It's a thriller. Uh, Washington DC is very close. You know, I, when I live in Oakton, it's just 30 minutes from DC. So uh, this is about, about Washington DC, her browser history. Yeah, let's see when it comes out. The publisher is, is on my case because, you know, one take, took an advance and spent it and has not written the book yet. So um. they're not happy. <laughs> they're not happy. <laughs> so that, that, that's, that's awesome. It's really interesting. Uh, to see what you're involved with. And we actually have some rapid fire questions now, which we have mainly to try to embarrass you, but uh, <laughs> I don't yeah, think we're going to accomplish that. <laughs> I think the first question I know the answer to, if you could live anywhere in the world post COVID, post lockdowns, where would it be? And I, I think it might be Hong Kong. Is that is that right? No, it would be Oakton, Virginia. That's my home. Man. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, I was thinking of something a little more exotic, <laughs> like Mauritius. No. Or, Saint Tropez no, or, or something. No, but okay. no, I, no I, I, I go back to Oakton. I love it. I love it too much. It's, yeah. it's, it's a awesome. curse to love a piece. Uh, That's great. Well, if you weren't in this industry, what would you be doing? I also think I know the answer there. So these questions aren't very revealing at this point. But what, what yeah. would you, I'd, I'd I assume writing. writing. Yeah. And the third question, what's your favorite pastime? Again, I'm guessing writing, probably reading too. I need, <laughs> Any good any, any good book suggestions that are not of your own authorship or? Yeah, you should you should um, you should read uh, a very underrated author who is my guru. I've never met him, but he's taught me a lot. Is Martin Cruz Smith, who wrote Gorky Park. Read him. Um, oh, that's that's a classic. Yeah, it's, that was published maybe what thirty years ago or yes, or yes. forty and it, maybe at this one, point. One of the few books that became an even better movie. Uh, but his other books are phenomenal. Hi Havana Bay, uh, he's just a great writer. Um, so he's one. And the other guy who I would recommend you read um, um, is, is a, a professor in Stanford. His name is Adam Johnson. He wrote a book called The Orphan Master's Son, which has to be one of the best books I've written. Never got a chance to get it. It's about North Korea. Brilliant book, brilliant book. 
Jamie, we, we may need a, uh, you know, a favorite author section in the show notes here. Well, this is I, a, amazing. This I'm is a down. I fun topic. What, <laughs> what I need to read next. I'm definitely picking these up. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us, Brom. It's been such a pleasure. You've taught me so much. I have oodles of notes here and I appreciate your <laughs> insight. Um, and, uh, and thank you, Evan, of always for joining us uh, as my fearless co-host here. And guys, if you've enjoyed watching or listening to today's Data Movers podcast, be sure to check us out, jsa.net slash podcast for upcoming Data Movers episodes. We release every other Wednesday. So uh, go ahead and uh, listen in there. Evan? Yeah, and be sure to follow us on my favorite platform, Twitter at Jay Scotto, and of course, Evan Kerstell, where we will engage and retweet you. In the meantime, as always, guys, happy networking.